Um, okay. Yep, thanks everyone for joining us for another one of our Meet the Specialist sessions today. Um, so today's session is with Eunice Gripen, um, a clinical nurse who has worked with Mac for a while. And she provides clear, concise and unbiased reviews of nursing matters as an expert witness in nursing, including maternal, neon, neonatal, uh, pediatric and adult, um, as well as having over 40 years of diverse clinical nursing experience to draw upon. She holds a Master of Health Law and has 15 years experience writing medical legal reports. And we're proud to have her on our expert panel. And over to you, Ms. Gribben. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, um, Sophia. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to say hi to everyone. Um, I guess my background, I trained in a small, busy, uh, semi-rural hospital. Um, which of course has changed now its function. Um, that was in the late 70s. Um, and we covered all areas. I, I then, it was a great general training. I then specialised in perioperative nursing at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, which was um, amazing at the time. It was a one year, really intense course. Um, and we were seconded out for paediatrics to what was then uh, the Children's Hospital in um, in Camperdown, which has now moved out to Westmead, of course. Um, and I worked at Westmead for about eight years in theatres there, uh, as well as post-operatively in the recovery area. And, and I also had quite a, a extensive um, input in research there and saw a lot of patients out in the wards as well and uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so that, that was a great experience as well. Uh, the kinds of cases that I report on, a lot of the cases are uh, failure to recognise deterioration and escalate up the chain of command, uh, which every hospital has a chain of command, which we are meant to follow. Uh, regardless of whether it's a small rural hospital, there's always somebody who is the end point of call uh, if things go wrong. Obviously, in a big city tertiary hospital, you've got a lot more people you can call on for help. Um, but, you know, there is um, a recognised failure to recognise deterioration and escalate. Um, people sent home from emergency when they clearly are suffering from sepsis um, or the very early signs of sepsis, which is missed, and uh, they're sent home and unfortunately uh, the end result is not good at all. Uh, quite a few people have died from that. Um, I've been involved in um, uh, annular nerve injuries, vaccine injuries, extravasation injuries, uh, both in paediatrics and adults, and, um, and that could be um, intravenous fluids, chemotherapy, iron, uh, they all have a devastating effect on, on the patient when, they are, when the fluid or the medication goes outside the vein. Uh, for example, one case I did where the patient had breast cancer, they'd had a mastectomy on one side, and they had what we call a port on the opposite side, which is a little dome underneath the skin. And, and all you see is a little lump underneath the skin. And that had, it's like a drum head in a way. And when the patient has chemotherapy, instead of having to cannulate them each time, which can destroy the veins in the arm, uh, and in, instead of them having a long line in the neck, um, a central line, they have this port and you access the port with a special needle that goes through the skin, through the drum of the port, and that is connected directly um, to the heart, so through the great vessels. So that's one way of delivering chemotherapy. What happened in this particular case was the it transpired and we were able to work out from the documentation that the needle they used to access the port was not actually long enough so it didn't actually access the port and the chemotherapy went into the tissues now that poor lady ended up losing her other breast as a result not because of cancer but because of the incorrect application of the um, chemotherapy 
Um, there's been a lot of cases of compartment syndrome as well. That's been missed in uh, recovery, in post-op care, um, or with injuries, um, uh, sporting injuries, patients come in, lower leg pain, uh, where they've been uh, kicked or hit with a ball or a bat or something. And turns out um, it has been compartment syndrome, which is missed. And in the leg, there's sort of three or four compartments and each of those compartments are segmented. And if the pressure builds up in any one of those compartments, then it cuts off the blood supply and nerve supply to that, to the lower limb uh, with devastating effects. And, and that can be easily missed if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, I've also uh, provided reports for cases involving the NDIA uh, for patient or uh, people who are on the NDIS. Um, and, and I have quite an understanding of the NDIS because I have an adult son myself who has Down syndrome and he accesses the NDIS. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had any problems to date. Um, his, his requirements are quite simple. Um, but for some people, I did a complex case up in Queensland recently where I actually went up to assess the patient and um, uh, clearly that patient needed one-to-one -one registered nursing care. He had extremely complex um, problems, but um, unfortunately the NDIA were only willing to offer a carer, one carer, um, and this fellow had a tracheostomy. He was nonverbal, developmental delay, um, severe um, epileptic, uh, had really severe seizures multiple times a day, and had had a fall at home and um, ended up a quadriplegic. So he was completely and utterly dependent on expert nursing care because if the tracheostomy tube came out, he could be dead by the time we got an ambulance. So he really needed a registered nurse um, and another person. You need two people to care for someone like that. Um, I don't know the outcome of that case as yet, but it was quite complex. Um, we do a lot of post-operative care, post-op falls, where patients who are still under the influence of anaesthetic or opioids they're told, yes, they can get up and go to the toilet. And of course, the bathroom is a really dangerous place because it's really hard surfaces and it can be wet. The floor can be wet. They can slip, they can fall, or they can just feel lightheaded getting up for the first time and pass out and hit their head. Um, we've had cases of people um, having catastrophic injury as a result. People have died as a result of those kind of falls. Um, a lot of elderly people getting up in the middle of the night, um, a bit disorientated, even climbing over bed rails, things like that, because they're, they're confused as to where they are. Um, so a lot of those kind of cases. Um, just trying to think what else. Um, I mean, basically, it's any kind of departure from the standards of nursing practice, uh, not following policy and procedure, clinical governance without, within the healthcare, healthcare facility um, and nurse injuries as well. And what we can do as nurses is we, because we're at the bedside 24 seven, we, we're across all the documentation. So when you send me a case, I can look at all the documentation and pull it all together. Um, observation charts, medication charts, um, uh, um, progress notes, care plans, incident reports, and we understand how to decipher the terminology. So we can bring it all together and help you understand um, what has actually gone on and what should have gone on. Uh, I've been involved in quite a few um, inquests, I think four now, four or five now to date. Uh, which I always find incredibly interesting. Um, Post-op uh, death um, from hysterectomy where the uh, post-op deterioration in drop in blood pressure, uh, pain outside um, uh, 
pain exceeding the pain medication they were given and, uh, and pain in excess of what they should have had for the particular procedure and deterioration day after day after day, which was not recognised as a problem. It was noted, it was, uh, observations were done and recorded in the notes, but there was no one who recognised the deterioration over the few days um, until sadly this lady died. Um, I was also involved in the lady, pregnant lady who was in a rural hospital. Um, she was uh, an Aboriginal lady and she had gone on New Year's Eve, really late New Year's Eve, she'd gone to the hospital because of pain. She was well known to the hospital because she'd had uh, really problematic uh, vomiting throughout the pregnancy. She'd had several um, uh, admissions to hospital for IV fluids because of the uh, shocking vomiting she had. Um, and But when she arrived at hospital this time, it was a different symptom and that wasn't recognised, that this was different. She was coming complaining of pain. They thought it was just simply the position of the baby. She was six months pregnant. They gave her some Panadol, did one set of observations, that was all, and sent her home um, by the morning. Both her and the baby had, had died uh, tragically. She was septic and that was missed. And the key part of that case from a nursing perspective was they didn't keep her long enough to do repeated observations. It's no use just going from one observation. You have to repeat them over a, a, even a short period of time just to see, is there a trend? Is it changing? Is it improving? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? That didn't happen. Um, re really, really sad. Um, I'm not sure how we're going for time, Sophia. I could talk all day. <laughs> um, we're going all right, actually. If you have any, it, it's quite interesting for the cases. So if you have any more like to share, you could just continue. It's fine um, for five more minutes or so. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll just um, carry on a little bit. Um, there was one particular case that uh, still sticks in my mind. It's 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 quite a, an early case that I did, uh, became part of the Garling Report. This young lady, only 24, um, at the time she was similar age to, I have three daughters as well, and she was similar age to my children. And uh, she'd been in a car accident, she had a fractured pelvis, no other injuries. Um, and this is so important in uh, from a nurse's perspective, you must listen to uh, the patient, the family, the friends. If they're telling you that it's nothing obvious, but there's something just not right about this person. Um, because from a nurse's point of view, this is the first time we've seen this person, so we've got nothing to go by. And if they seem to be okay, maybe a little bit, you know, fuzzy or whatever, we might see that as, oh, well, it's obvious she's had a car accident, you know, she's a little bit upset and all that sort of thing. But in this case, the family kept saying, She's not right. There's something not right. She's slurring her speech. Um, she's not remembering which of her friends came in the day before. She's thinking nobody's been, all those kinds of things. Um, she had extreme headaches and she had frequent vomiting. And unfortunately, what happened was she was being repeatedly treated for those things. So they kept increasing the antiemetics, kept increasing um, the pain relief, but nothing was solving the problem and nothing was changing what other family and friends had picked up with her. And, and even when the family went to the front desk and complained, um, whoever they spoke to would say, oh, actually, she's not my patient, so I, I can't comment. Um, it's probably nothing. It's probably just the medication. That's why she's, you know, uh, seeing a, a bit off to you. Uh, unfortunately, it took um, until several days later when uh, one of the doctors re um, requested more bloods to see what was going on. And it turned out her bloods had been taken when she came in 
And within a couple of days, it had actually her sodium level, so her salt levels, had deteriorated quite a bit. And sodium only has a very fine bracket to be between. Too high has problems, too low has serious problems. And in her case, her sodium was dropping. And it turned out, it looked like she'd been overinfused. She'd had too much fluid. And, and you can imagine with salt and water, you put more water, the amount of sodium reduces. And that's what had happened in her case, but it wasn't picked up. When people looked at the notes, even if doctors came and reviewed her, they looked at everything. But at that time, there were paper notes and the um, pathology, the pathology was online. Everything else was paper notes and they weren't looking at the pathology and neither were the nurses and they ought to have been because that would have shown that the um, sodium was low. There was a problem in that case as well because the nurse who had recorded that the sodium was low when pathology rang the very first time to warn that the sodium was too low, she was an agency nurse and she just documented in the note. She was inexperienced. I was able to find out from her CV and check when she registered. She was a new nurse. She shouldn't have been in charge of a patient like that. Um, she went home. She didn't tell anybody that the sodium was low because she didn't recognise the importance of it. And she deteriorated um, over several, several weeks. She ended up um, in, um, in ICU. Uh, she was rapidly corrected and it seemed like it was going okay, like she was recovering. But unfortunately, she deteriorated again. She ended up in a, a locked-in syndrome for about four years and eventually died when she was 28. It was, it was just so tragic, so unavoidable um, in, in a young lady. So, yeah, some, some tragic cases along the way that I've been fortunate to have uh, been able to um, assess. And it is a privilege. It's a privilege to go through these cases. When, when a lawyer sends me a case, if I feel it's outside my area of expertise, I will call them and say so and suggest someone else if I know someone else. Um, if it's uh, a case that um, I feel I can't support, I can't support their claim, then I will also ring and let let the lawyer know because it's it's it's, it's just not ethical to write a report if it's not going to be um, helpful to, to the courts. So, yeah, that's, that's just about it. <laughs> yep, thank you, Eunice. That was some very interesting uh, real-life examples. I was hooked. Um, um, what, does anyone have any questions that you guys want to ask? It's for the Q&A time now, so... Um, if anyone has any questions, just unmute yourself and just come forward, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, we don't have anything in the chat. So it seems like we don't have any questions. Um, but That's yes, right. <laughs> so thank you, Eunice, so much. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh,